Good afternoon, DEC members and guests. I'm Steve Gregorian, President and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club, coming to you from lovely downtown Detroit. A couple of quick announcements before we get started today. I do want to take a brief moment to thank the terrific DEC sponsors for their continued support of our mission, and you're seeing those on your screen right now. And I want to thank you for continuing to support the DEC with your membership. On a programming note, May at the DEC, I think we've got something for everyone. On May 4th, we'll continue our monthly Money Talk series, this time with John Lynch, Chief Investment Officer at Comerica Bank. On May 12th, we're hosting CEO of Delta Airlines, Ed Bastian. And on May 19th, we'll host Dan Schulman, who you may know is the CEO of PayPal. And plenty of other events in between with more to come. So, you also already know how important it is to the DEC that high school and college students are included in everything we do. And today we wanna to say welcome to students from Cornell University and Schoolcraft College and the following high schools, Waterford Mott, Frontier International Academy, Riverview and Dearborn Divine Child. And you know, I love to talk about the DEC's incredible history of speakers briefly. And our speaker today joins a distinguished list of 13 others who in our 87 year history have addressed the DEC on this date, April 20th. And that list includes 1964, the NASA administrator who delivered a speech to us titled, Why Go to the Moon? And in 1998, we hosted Vice President Dan Quayle. And finally, in 2010, you might remember ABC's Cokie Roberts. And today we're pleased to add Jeff Immelt as our 14th speaker on this day in history. And we were honored to host Jeff in 2006 and 2009, and again today. So let's get started. Jeff is a former chairman of GE and served as CEO for 16 years. Today, he's a venture partner at New Enterprise Associates, which is a global VC firm based in California and he teaches at Stanford University's Business School. He's been named one of the world's best CEOs three times by Barron's. He also chaired the Council on Jobs and Competitiveness for President Obama. He earned his BA from Dartmouth College and an MBA from Harvard University. And of course, he's the author of a new book that's our subject today called Hot Seat, What I Learned Leading a Great American Company. It's a terrific book. And at the end of today's program, we're gonna have some fun Three of you will be randomly selected and the DEC is gonna send you the hot seat book. And throughout today's program, we'll share the Amazon link so you can purchase the book. So Jeff's joining us today from California. It's still early there. So let's say hello and welcome Jeff back to Detroit. Steve, great, great to be with you again. I've got a lot of sentimental uh, uh, understanding and love of Detroit. So it's always great to be back. Thank you. Well, before we get into the book, let's talk about that because we know you've got a local connection and hint, hint, the last time we hosted you was at the Townsend Hotel in Birmingham. So tell us about that connection. Yeah, my wife grew up uh, in Birmingham. Her father worked at Ford. Uh, she went to Sioux Home High School. Uh, we were married at Christ Church of Cranbrook and, and uh, the rest is history. And uh, be, other than that, Steve, you know, I started my career really selling plastics in Detroit. Yes. And I learned so much from the automotive industry and all the people around it. So I, I, I have such a debt of gratitude to the city and the people. Well, you do know us well. So I want to set some context, Jeff, for your book. Uh, if you'd allow me to, please. Hot seat, it's your account of what you learned at your time atop one of America's largest corporations and of what it means to be in the hot seat and having full responsibility for your lonely, challenging, and one of the most scrutinized jobs certainly in the world. And I think you do a really great job of capturing how the business world has changed. And you call out ideas that succeed in the book and some that don't. And I think you're candid, raw, and honest. And you really did make me feel and understand what being in the hot seat was like. And, and you and I talked earlier, now that I've read it, I think back to those dates that I mentioned that you were at the DEC and little did I know the things you were dealing with at that time. So let's get into the book a bit. So it's June, 2018, you're uncertain about writing a book after you leave GE and you're teaching a class at Stanford Graduate School of Business. What changed your mind about writing the book? 
Yeah, Steve, look, my my career didn't end the way I wanted it to. And and I it, it, again, I in the book I own, you know, the mistakes I made and, and things like that. But I, I was really unhappy with the context with which the company was being covered. And I think through the volatile times I lived, I learned that truth equals facts plus context. And I felt like the context around uh, GE had gone missing and, and it damaged, it hurt a lot of people and including many of those that were in the company. So I hired a co-author, I asked her to go out and interview almost 80 people, both former colleagues and people in the ecosystem to really provide a story of, of what happened, of what went right, what went wrong. And so I wanted to do that, Steve, on behalf of all the great people I worked with. Other than that, look, uncertainty. And I, I felt like by telling stories of leadership through uncertainty, you know, I might be able to help people that are going through COVID or going through a job crisis or going through, you know, uh, difficulties with their team. And so that's really what we try to do, Steve, is, is string a, a series of stories to talk about, here's what we saw, here's what we did, here's how I felt, here's what worked and what didn't work. And hopefully that's what came through in the book. Yeah, before we get into some of that stuff, tell us, it's now summer of 2001, and you get named CEO, and before you start, you join your buddies for a golf outside Chicago, and you're wearing a shirt with a GE logo, GE logo. tell us about that. Yeah, so, you know, I replaced a famous guy, and somebody that I had immense respect for, uh, Jack Welch, who was named the best manager of the previous century, so that's a tough act to follow. So I'm, I'm playing golf with friends at a country club in Chicago. It was an annual journey. I'm in the locker room changing shoes. And one of the members who I had never met before said, what do you do? And I was going to become CEO of the company in two weeks. And I said, well, I work at GE. And he strokes his chin and says, GE, huh? I feel sorry for that poor son of a bitch that's going to replace Jack Welch, right? <laughs> so I got to the first tee and for the next 20 years, my friends and I have kind of laughed at that story, but that was a little bit about what it felt like, uh, you know, when you replace somebody that famous. That's, that's so cool. So your story begins on your very first day as CEO, September 10th, 2001. And we all know what happened that very next fateful day. So tell us about your first days and weeks. Yeah, look, I mean, I had been, had gone through a very carefully orchestrated succession process and the day after I became CEO, the whole world changed. Uh, I was in Seattle when I watched the airplane hit the second World Trade Center building. Uh, we insured the World Trade Center. We owned the airplanes that, that crashed. Uh, NBC ran without commercials for four or five days. And so, you know, almost immediately I was thrown into a crisis, nothing that had prepared really anybody, both the, the tragedy for our nation, but also Almost every business was impacted. And I, I think I think it began to, you know, every crisis is different, but there's some things that are the same about uh, leaders absorbing fear, uh, being willing to make decisions in a crowded room when you don't have perfect information. I think, Steve, holding two truths, that bad things can still get, you know, things can always get worse, but there's still an opportunity to play for the future. Uh, the need to communicate through crisis. And I just think, you know, the importance of showing up if you're a leader in bad times. You know, the picture you showed when I looked like a much, much younger man <laughs> was in June of 2009. Let me tell you, my world was horrible in June of 2009. Yeah. But, but we made the decision to keep showing up, to go to places like the, the Detroit Economic Club, because the message you would send to a really important town was, GE was okay, right? We were, we were in business. We were going to keep going forward. You, you can count on us as a partner and a, and a supplier and things like that. And those things are extremely valuable. So I, I learned some of those lessons my very first uh, day on the job. Yeah, well, thank you again for, for visiting us during that crazy time in 2009 too. So when you take over um, in 2001, GE is really two parts. You've got tons of industrial divisions and then there's your gigantic and ubiquitous financial arm called GE Capital. And in the wake of 9-11, and you've got meltdowns at Enron and WorldCom, and cracks are starting to show at GE Capital. And you also see risks on the horizon at 
GE Power Aviation and NBC TV, which you own, because now here comes cable TV. So you decide you've got to make some bold invest investments and you've got to do it quickly. Uh, and this is a really important chapter as we all think about how to grow our businesses. So Jeff, talk about the principles that guided your acquisitions, including what to do and when to do it. Yeah, you know, so Steve, what we had kind of a rundown industrial uh, portfolio and a really good financial service business and our stock traded like a tech truck. So we were a 50 PE, half industrial. And I think the board and I knew that we just had to retool the company and had to invest, right? So I think, you know, investing is something that people aren't necessarily trained to do in big companies that, you know, taking multi-billion dollar swings one after another after another. But, you know, as the world changes, if you want to stay contemporary, you've got to continue to take those swings. So, uh, you know, what, what guided us, Steve, is we wanted the company to be more technical, more global, and be in businesses that were close to customers. And that's really what we set about doing. We made big investments in life sciences, renewable energy. We made huge investments in our aviation business. And then we started slowly to whittle away at the financial service piece, uh, you know, kind of at the same time. So making big bets is what the company, you know, had to do. I, I was reading just in the paper this morning that uh, GM Mary Barra made an announcement of a battery technology in, uh, in Tennessee. You know, a lot of these bets don't pay off for decades, 10 or 20 uh, years. And so, you know, that's what you have to be willing to do before you have to in order to make uh, in order to make change. Uh, the last story I tell is like one of the big bets we made in 2003 was to do the engine for the Boeing Dreamliner. So, you know, in a crisis, I talk about leaders holding two truths. Alan Mulally, who's a son of uh, Detroit, more or less, given yes. his experience at Ford, he made the decision in 2002 that Boeing was going to do the next aviation uh, uh, moonshot, if you will, called the Dreamliner. And the commercial aviation industry was on its butt at that time. And we decided to do the engine, which was a $2 billion bet. So believe me, there's no, nobody on earth could do a payback memo on that investment at that moment, at that moment in time. But look, if you believe in the future, if you believe in industries, those are the investments you have to make. So if you're running a big company in Detroit or any place else, you need to develop the people that are willing to take the big swings because that's what's going to move the company forward. Yeah, let's talk a little more, uh, more about that. So we've already established you know Detroit very well, and you know how important our hometown auto industry is. And you've got a chapter called Leaders Are Systems Thinkers. And you write, think about any CEO of a legacy automotive company and you're right, all the options are not great right now with the coming age of electric and autonomous vehicles. Uh, and you say leaders must dare to invest. You kind of talked about that even in uncertain times. But just talk about your thoughts on the massive transformation going on in the auto industry that uses yeah. some plastics too. Yeah, you know, in that, in that chapter, I talk about two big changes that we invest in at GE. One was called Ecoimagination, which was investing in clean tech. And that was really started in 2005. And the other one was, you know, kind of out front of the digital transformation that we started in 2010. I'd say eco-imagination worked really well and digital transformation didn't work as well as certainly uh, we wanted it to. But I think you've got to be able to look horizontally across your markets and see how big changes are taking place. And, you know, what you, what you learn, I think, Steve, is the change happens slowly and then all at once, right? So, so you can be right about a theme but knowing when to invest is sometimes uh, incredibly difficult. So if you take a look at battery technology, if you invested in 2000, 2005 or 2010, it was horrible, right? You lost <laughs> tens of billions of dollars. But now the path for electric vehicles is clear and, and is, is gonna take place. And I would say autonomous is gonna happen right after that. So if you put yourself now in the shoes, not just of the CEO of GE, but the CEO of Ford or Daimler or Chrysler, you know, you, you now see the inevitability of the, your, your basic technology, let's say, of how you make cars for 100 years. The next 100 years are going to be dramatically different. So you've got to go through, do you make or you buy? Do you partner? 
How much do you do by yourself? How much do you do you uh, uh, trust to be outsourced? How many new competitors is electric vehicles going to bring? I, I guarantee you there's 20 EVs on the drawing board right now. But the ability of leaders to kind of see these systems unfold, know when and how to invest is really key. Now, the other point I'd make, Steve, that I learned in my life is like knowing what to do is sometimes not hard. In fact, it's frequently easy. Knowing when to do it is actually the hard decision. And I think sometimes I got in trouble because we were too early. And when you're too early, you have to find a way to sustain the momentum. I, I would say in the digital case, we were probably five years ahead of where others in our yes. industry yes. you know, were. Now today, if you said in 2021, it's happening, right? It's, it's smart to be there, yeah. but we started early, we quit early, and now we're too late to kind of get back in it. So having a sense of time is absolutely key. And then I, I think if you're in the automotive, like a legacy automotive player, being willing to partner on autonomous versus doing it yourself, those are the only choices you can make in some of these technologies, really. You just don't have enough capability in-house to build on your own. So you also have to know how to partner. But, you know, Steve, I think that I, I just recap one of the most important points is that change always happens. And sometimes it seems like it happens slowly and then all at once. And I think that's how electric vehicles feels today. Yeah, folks, I remind you, uh, there's the link, Amazon link in the chat room. So... Uh, it's a great read. There are tons of stories we're just not going to have uh, time to get to today. So I encourage you to buy this book. So, Jeff, back to uh, the book. Chapter five, you've got a, a, a bunch of intense stories in there. Leaders Persevere in a Crisis is the name of that chapter. So let me take you back to September 2008. And as we all remember, the American economy is in a free fall and everything bad's happening at breakneck speed, and you've got to raise $15 billion in 24 hours. So tell us about September 2008 inside GE, and what lessons did you learn from that? You know, Steve, the, um, I, I could never describe a more intense month in my life than September of 2008 in the global financial crisis. You, you know, COVID is horrible. It's had an impact on so many lives, and I feel so sad about that. And it's impacted industries. 9-11, same way, impacted uh, so many lives. And so never get me wrong, those are the worst of all worlds. But if you were in financial services the day Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, look, your world was rocked. And in our case, you know, we didn't take deposits. We were kind of a, a debt-driven, a wholesale-funded, what was called finance company, and we were huge. Right, we were we were Gigantic. maybe I couldn't believe how big it was. Yeah, we were the sixth or seventh biggest financial services, and we were so basically our markets were crushed. And uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt on September fifteenth, and then Washington Mutual uh, went bankrupt, and the bondholders got wiped out. And this was on a on a Friday night, and my CFO and I sat with Goldman Sachs on a Friday evening, and we had to have a virtual. This is before Zoom, a telephonic board call on Saturday morning because we decided that we needed to raise $18 billion on Monday. So I get on the call, it's just my CFO and I, my general counsel, and I've got maybe 15 board members spread around the world. And I say, hey team, you know, as you do, you know, things are tough out there and our credit default swaps have rocked out and uh, we're gonna raise $18 billion, right? So we had no charts, no nothing, and silence, dead silence. And then Roger Pinsky, who I love, who you the all board, know. Board member of the Detroit. Board member of GE, there. who just was my, my favorite board member of all time. I just love. He, he just says, and literally, guys, dead silence for like two minutes. Roger says, let's get the cash. Let's get it now. And then everybody else, 14 other board members say, yeah, let's get the cash. Let's get the cash. <laughs> so I think without Roger, we'd still be in that conference room in Fairfield, Connecticut, even today. So, you know, we tried to go Sunday night. We couldn't go Sunday night because TARP failed in the U.S. government. And I, people in the automotive industry remember this time as well because you were badly impacted. We went to get uh, the cash on a Wednesday. We raised it all. It, it all worked. Uh, Buffett was an investor. It was crazy a couple of days. And then, you know, at that moment, uh, the company was safe. And... I would always say that set of decisions over four or five days, this was the most important decisions I ever made as a leader of any kind. 
and I was crushed for it, right? I was pilloried in the press. I was thrown under the bus by everybody. But, but it's just like, you know, I think for all of us, when you go through tough times, um, you know, sometimes you just are the one that has to make the decision. You're going to get second guessed and judged, and I was. But I think you got to look around the table that the people you trust and respect, and uh, that ultimately is going to be the measuring stick. Now, I, I would say, Steve, that that, that two-year time period, 2008 and nine, and part of 2010, I, I really was so proud of the GE team. You, you know, in other words, if you're if you're surrounded by people you trust, and and the board and the leadership team, you know, we were dealing with bad news almost continuously, but we made smart decisions. We made them when we had to. We were able to retain most of the key leaders. And in some ways that was the finest, you know, kind of, I'd say set of teamwork, a, a group of, uh, of teams that I'd ever worked with. And nobody ever pointed fingers. You know, the people in the healthcare business, which was doing great, they never came to work and pointed fingers at G Capital and said, you guys, you guys are costing us. You're hurting my stock price, things like that. Everybody in the company, simultaneously said, how can we help? How can we be there for you? And you never see things until the worst day. You never, you never know much about talent. You never know much about teamwork. You never know about culture. You never know about boards, really. If you look around your boardroom, don't judge it on a good day. Say, okay, when everything's going wrong, which board member is gonna be with me? Which is gonna pretend like they never heard what was going on? And who is gonna be more concerned about protecting their own reputation versus protecting the reputation of the company? If you can put yourself through that mindset, you'll be in good shape. Well, I couldn't read that one fast enough. The brain and the eyes weren't going fast enough. So you really did make me feel like what it was like yeah. to be in, in that hot seat. So. Uh, great segue. You talked about people. And one thing that stood out for me, Jeff, throughout the book was the importance that you placed on GE people and culture. And I was fascinated by uh, you holding 90 one-on-one -on -one weekend meetings with your senior leaders. So tell us about that and why people and culture factored into every decision that you made. Yeah, look, when you run a really big company, particularly a conglomerate of that era, you, you know, you just don't know everything that's going on all the time. And you really have to have people that you respect and trust around you. Uh, coming out of the financial crisis, I was just so burned out. And I was just so, I was just, you know, I had lost my confidence a little bit. And I, I really had, was losing some of the passion I had. And one of the things that always regenerated me was my connection with people. So what, what we decided to do was invite a senior leader into kind of my home once a month. Mm -hmm. And they and their spouse and my wife and I, we would have dinner in town. And then we would spend five or six hours on a Saturday morning with no phones ringing. And it was really simple. It was like, um, I, I knew their career, so I could talk about themselves. I wanted to talk about their business. And I wanted to give them a chance to talk about the company, what, what they liked, what they didn't like. And it was a free ranging discussion and it just built incredible connection. And sometimes people got promoted on Monday. Uh, sometimes they were <laughs> the <weekend. laughs> You know, you were able to say, you know, somebody said, look, I want to be CFO of the company. And I would say, look, you're not going to be CFO of the company, but you can be a really good service leader in this business. This is how you can apply yourself. Uh, one time a person convinced myself to sell a business I didn't want to sell. Because he said, basically, we're not making progress. You're, you you had no idea what's going on. And, you know, those, those are the kind of discussions you like. Now, Steve, you know, I learned, you know, I, I think Jack Welch's special skill is I've never seen a leader before or after that knew how to, you know, communicate to a big organization and run a big organization at scale. And one of the things I always marveled at with Jack is he had a voice for 300,000 people. He had a voice for 500 people. He had a voice for 20 people and he had a voice for one person and he would use different words, different tonality. So that you always knew where he was coming from. And that was a gift. Right. And so I always felt like Jack's ability to connect across multiple businesses, multiple geographies, multiple, multiple size ranges was something I always aspired to and something I always admired in him. And so to a certain extent, I had a great teacher in terms of how to communicate to large organizations. And, you know, Steve, I've, I've seen presidents of countries, 
every CEO in the world I've met, I've never seen anybody that could do it like Jack Welch could do it, and never once. So I think every leader has a special skill. That was his special skill. Jeff, whenever anyone asks you to recommend a business leadership book, I was fascinated to learn your answer. You point them towards military histories. Tell us why. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I first I have such respect for the military, but it, you know, battles are studies of pivoting, managing failure, knowing how to press an advantage. And look, most look, there's a reason why, you know, I never thought I'd write a business book, Steve, but there's a reason, reason why they do so poorly, because they basically have a theme that says, I'm perfect, follow me. <laughs> you know? And if you read the history of Gettysburg or, you know, the trilogy that uh, Atkinson wrote about World War II, you start in Africa where the U.S. military couldn't do anything right, right? And you end up in D-Day where they were a finely honed machine and people made mistakes and changed. So I teach my business school students, I always give them three or four military books to read just because I think they're studies of pivoting, of managing failure, of pressing an advantage, which is what business leaders really need to understand. Yeah. That sets the stage for the next topic and that's Project Hubble. That's your code word for it's time to unwind GE Capital and $400 billion in assets. Tell us about that fascinating experience and the bold decision to exit that highly lucrative financial services business that was just such a gigantic piece of your balance sheet. Yeah, look, it was, so what was unique about GE and what I don't think will ever be done again is the breadth of the portfolio all on the same balance sheet and, and a very intricately woven balance sheet is that you would generate industrial cash, you would lever it eight to one, and you would get on financial service earnings, you would get, you know, kind of at least an industrial multiple and frequently a tech multiple on top of that. So right. I just don't think that'll ever be replicated again. So unwinding that was extremely uh, difficult. Uh, the mistake we made that I made and, and that I own is that we let it get too big. That not, not that we were, I mean, we were a AAA rated uh, company the day that Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. So. I don't think we were we were trying to redline it or be foolish around it, but it was big, and and that was on me, and and so we became a systemic institution when the new uh, financial services regulations came in, and just the the amount of regulatory let's say structure on top of really a conglomerate was uh, hugely difficult and hugely challenging, and was something we really had to manage. And, and so that led the board and I to make the decision around 2015 that we really needed to pivot in the company because it was just an extraordinary set of uh, uh, circumstances, let's say, on the company and on the business. And so we called that Project Hubble. Uh, we announced it in early April of 2015 that we were basically going to dispose of all but... Uh, the G capital businesses that financed our industrial assets. Um, you know, we went to bed the night before thinking that, you know, the stock could be up slightly or down 20% because we're basically taking 20% uh, or 50% of the company's earnings, announcing a sale of it without knowing exactly kind of where that uh, was going to be replaced or where that was going to come from. And so that was uh, that was a big event. And then we executed on that. We sold pieces for the next uh, uh, two years. Yeah. We stopped being a systemic institution. And, and uh, that was kind of like one of the biggest pivots, I would say, in the, in the kind of the history of uh, U.S. corporate activity uh, done with an immense amount of scrutiny and done in a very challenging way and challenging time. But it's one I never have looked back on in terms of whether it was the right thing to do. You know, see, we would literally have board meetings. Well, we had to let the board go up to 18 people because we needed to have a certain amount of financial executives in the, in the, on the board. We would spend 90% of every board meeting on financial services, kind of squeezing in, you know, oh, by the way, we're also launching two new aircraft engines or we're 
we're building a healthcare factory in China and things like that. And it was just, a, a would say, too big of a, a burden on our board. So that was what we decided to do and when we decided to do it. Yeah. Folks, uh, there are tons and tons of terrific lessons that you can learn. I encourage you to buy the book. Most of us aren't going to manage 300,000 people like Jeff did or, or run a balance sheet with worth gazillions of, of dollars, but there's lessons from a sole practitioner to large corporations. So uh, thank you, Jeff. I wanna switch to some uh, questions we received from the audience in our remaining time. We've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, I want to focus on former President Trump to, to get us started. You've got a funny little golf story. Uh, you're trumping, uh, you're golfing with President Trump, and you're trying to get him to do The Apprentice. Tell us about that. Yeah, we owned NBC, you know, for probably up until about 2010 or 11. And in 2004, we made the decision to launch The Apprentice. And look, I stayed engaged on NBC. It wasn't like I was going to write a script or anything like that, but we cared about the business and I wanted to be involved and people described kind of what The Apprentice was going to be. It didn't seem like it could ever work. I, I have to be honest with you when, when we first looked at it, but uh, we went to play golf at uh, uh, President Trump's golf course um, to really try to convince him to do The Apprentice. Uh, we got to maybe the sixth or seventh hole, which was a par three. He um, stood at the tee and turned around to three of us and said, you know, I'm the richest golfer in the world, right? And everybody laughs and guffaws and says, oh, you know, you're, that's just what you do, things like that. He gets a hole in one, right? So just stands up. We could all see the ball going into the hole. And so, you know, you kind of sit there and say, uh, that's a story that, you know, you, you never thought he was going to become president of the United States one day, but literally when... Uh, I was back in the White House as a group group of business leaders in 2017. We're going around the table, introducing ourselves. And President Trump says, "Hey, Jeff, tell our story to everybody." There's CNN and CNBC and everybody watching in. So I I had the chance to tell that story more than once. That's amazing. Uh, let's stick with the former President Trump theme. Um, let's get your thoughts on protectionism anti-globalization movement, trade deals. Did he have it right? Uh, where do you think we should be headed? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, President Trump didn't invent nationalism. This was underway long before he became president. Uh, I could see the, the ebbs and flows of globalization changing, probably during the financial crisis um, to, you know, trade deals were gonna become impossible to do. And, and being able to be a local player in countries was just going to take precedent. Now, look, I grew up in the generation that basically felt like we could shut down factories in the U.S. and we could move it to Mexico or China or any place we wanted to and do it without really any kind of, you know, we, we all have thoughts on jobs and things like that. But basically, if we said we want to be competitive, we want to be productive, this is management rights, let's go do it. We did that, right? That was the generation that I grew up in. That's not good anymore. That changed, I would say, sometime in the 2000, 2010 time period. And let me tell you, we actively, we, we brought manufacturing back to the US. We started thinking about globalization, not so much as let's do labor arbitrage, wherever the cheapest labor is, let's go do it. We started building factories where we wanted to penetrate markets, right? So we became a local player uh, not necessarily, you know, we, we became global by being more local, not global by investing in trade deals and things like that. So that's anybody that didn't see that coming before Trump became president had their head in the, in the ground. Now, you know, where are we today? We're in a situation where the two biggest economies in the world are kind of heading towards a, a, a trade war. Now, China exists, you know, in other words, They've been graduating more engineers uh, than the US and Europe combined for 30 years. They're going to have their own car companies. They're going to have their own banks. They're going to have big airframers and go down the list. You know, Steve, I, I'm not qualified to speak about military aspects and cyber and things like that are really important, but the Chinese market is real. 
the Chinese government is moving everywhere in the world from the Middle East, Africa to Latin America. And, and I just think we need to be able to compete in China. We, we should be arguing to have their market open if our, our market's open and we need to have an economic relationship with China. I tell my students, it doesn't matter who the president of the United States is, they're not gonna protect you uh, from China, right? Maybe we'll go to war, let's hope not. But, but the economy of China, you're not gonna be protected from, right? So you, you better learn how to compete there. You better learn how to sell there. You better learn how to compete with Chinese companies around the world. And, and my fear, Steve, is that we're generating, a, we're, we're producing a generation of leaders, young people, who are afraid of China, who, who feel like they can't go there, they can't sell there, they can't be there. And I think that's a big mistake. So I, I still believe that a Chinese economy is relevant, it's real, it's big, Chinese companies are growing and we better figure out a way to coexist. I, I guess last point, um, if you believe in climate change or electric vehicles, the future is gonna be more determined in China than even the US, just given its size and scale. Yeah, um, uh, really appreciate your thoughts on China. And actually, uh, we we got an email question in from a DEC member, also named Jeff. Um, what are you telling your Stanford business students today about the business world, excepting what you already talked about, China? Yeah, look, I, I just, I, I think they have to be willing to kind of observe and, uh, and, and be relevant in the world they see today. So in some ways, a lot of the fundamentals of leadership are the same era after era. I think if you're gra going to graduate in 2021, you have to be, you know, kind of a digital native as well as, a, as an industrial native. So you need to be attuned to the new technologies and the new business models. And you have to be a student of the world. I, I always teach a class on context, which is how the leader fits with the world. And so uh, today, business leaders are expected to have a point of view on social, uh, 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 social topics, on the environment. And, and, you know, you better be as a leader well versed on what it means. You have to know how to read laws and understand trends and know that you can't escape uh, the ability to understand context. On the last day of class, I always say, look, uh, good leaders, successful careers answer three questions. How fast you can learn, because, you know, look, when I graduated and joined GE, I never thought I would have to be a China pro, a China expert, but I became one because I had to. Yeah. How much you can give to others, right? Because if you want to be a business person, you're not going to get there by yourself and you better be a trusted friend and a trusted partner. And how much you can take, you know, in other words, you know, people don't succeed because they're always the smartest. They succeed because they can get punched in the nose, pick themselves up, learn, get better, and do it again the next day and the next day and the next day. And so frequently people stop themselves. They don't get stopped because they, they're not smart enough. They get stopped because they just can't take it anymore. And, and I, I urge, urge them to answer those three questions. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, DEC member Lisa says the public role of CEOs is getting more difficult as employees and clients expect more policy activism. So talk about this as everything today is so highly charged and highly political. What are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I'd say first, you have to understand that that's the reality. Uh, second, learn things on your own, right? Every CEO should have read the Georgia election law, right? Don't, don't trust others to read it for you. Uh, you. You need to have your own understanding if you're gonna speak. Uh, third, pick your spots, right? You, you can't, as a CEO, you can't weigh in to every debate. You need to, you, you need to really be heard on those that are important to you and your company and, and, and where you really have domain expertise, where you really can speak. And then lastly, know that 50% um, of your employees, if you're gonna speak up, don't agree with you. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't speak, but you should respect their points of view as well, right? Um, you know, President Trump became president, you know, Steve, the first thing he does is he issues the Muslim travel ban. I spoke up personally and loudly that that was wrong because we as a company, we had 30,000 Muslims that worked for us. They, they were our, 
our friends and our colleagues. I knew the region, I knew the dynamics well. And, and so I spoke as a singular voice. I was very specific and, and I took a stand. Um, you know, I got lots of emails of support inside the company. I got a lot of emails that said, why don't you just keep your mouth shut, right? So just understand, and I respected them all, but, but it was important to me. I, had, I knew the situation probably as well or better than anybody, and I wanted my voice to be heard. Same with the environment, same with diversity, uh, same with lots of things. So you're gonna have to be heard, um, but do your homework. Just do your homework before you speak. Great, here's a question that came in uh, in the chat room from uh, Michael uh, in New York City. Uh, originally from Raleigh, North Carolina. He loves your Durham Bulls vest. He wants to know, what have you learned during your time in VC that you wish you knew during your time at GE? And what were some of the biggest challenges going from a public company to VC and the habits that you had to change? Such a great question. I wish I had done a sabbatical um, earlier on uh, and spent some time here. I, I really have seen the power of technology and disruption. And that, you know, even though I was always a big investor in technology, I would have done even more if I'd seen where the world was going. I, I ran the company to be a big company. So, you know, we had eight big businesses. I would have run the company if I, if I had it to do over again to be maybe a hundred smaller P&Ls because I just think there's something about accountability and, and something about innovation when you see it at a, at a smaller level. Um, I, I, I think that uh, those are kind of the two biggest things I've seen. And just the, the I'd say the strength of focus. Like when, when you only have one thing and, and your whole net worth is associated with that one thing, man, do you get a lot of stuff done. And that's hard to replicate in a, uh, in a big company sometimes. Um, look, I had worked in big companies for a long time. I wanted to, think small again. So in some ways the transition to be a private investor, you know, kind of being either on private boards or working with CEOs is a joy. And, and I kind of felt like it was a way that I could give back, uh, you know, to the business world is, is helping entrepreneurs is, uh, is um, you know, kind of uh, teaching students and things like that. I, I think the last thing I would say to my friends in the automotive industry is, look, when I joined GE in 1982, 95% of all students would think about going to work in GE. Now that's maybe 50%. You know, the, the American dream today is to start your own company, not to go to work at a big company. And I think we all need to be cognizant of that. Not that we need to be afraid of it, but we need to create other ways for people to join our companies and be able to do a career that goes small to big uh, and, 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 and unless we do that, we're just not going to see the best people. Can you give us some quick thoughts? We've got a question in the chat room. Uh, I'll paraphrase it on uh, diversity in the CEO office, women in the CEO office and lack thereof, and also in boardrooms. Yeah, look, I think um, we didn't make as much progress as we needed to in diversity. Uh, we always tried very hard and it was the CEO level uh, initiative. But I, I, think, I think the past generation's mistake was not hard enough metrics. You know, in other words, you need to recruit diversity, you need to retain diversity and you need to take whatever the senior ranks are. And that has to be metrically diverse, right? Because, you know, African-Americans make it safe for other African-Americans in the board. Women on the board make it safe for other other women. So the mistake we make is we feel like we, in order to have a meritocracy, we can't have metrics. I think that's been proven to be wrong. I, I think what you need to say is, look, if, if we're not getting 5% more diverse every year, we're failing. And, and we can do that while still being a meritocracy. That's what leaders need to need to have today. And, and let me tell you, for every uh, you know, Mary Barra that exists as a CEO in boardrooms, she brings thousands of women who say, I can do it, you know, and, and it just speaks uh, so loudly, uh, you know, in the context of what has to happen. So I, I think we, there's never been a successful initiative in any company that didn't have hard metrics, and we need to have hard metrics around diversity. 
Thanks, Jeff. I want to end with something from your last chapter, which coincidentally is titled Leaders Are Optimists. And you write, leaders must remember the world turns and leaders must learn to recognize the difference between a tailwind and good management. Talk about that, please. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think um, in the end, the mistakes I regret the most are ones made on people. And, and sometimes not seeing people enough when times were bad. And so they, they went through a good cycle and we thought they were good. And, and when they finally got tested, they failed. So, so this, this ability to see people through tough cycle, you know, we've all just been through, through COVID. You've know, you, you know more about your teams now than ever before. And this is an element that you have to kind of understand is that hopefully your, your stacking of talent is different now than it was uh, pre-COVID because you've seen people in different uh, ways. I, I think beyond that, you know, in your career, make friends. You, 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 you should treat everybody with respect because you never know uh, how the world's going to turn and when it comes around. You know, I, I've had tough times as I ended my career. But people like uh, Richard Anderson and John Chambers and Ken Chenault, they've been true friends and they've helped me get through uh, tough times. So I, I'd say, you know, the nature of the book is to show people that you can still have a productive life and career, even when things don't go the way you want them to, you know, Steve, and business people have to have to understand that. Right. You, you're going to have Ed Bastian on in a couple of weeks. Yes. You know, the aviation industry has got crushed by COVID. Right. So aviation gets hurt. Zoom does great. Right. Zoom yeah. does great. Now, you know, it doesn't mean Zoom's better managed than Delta. It's not. I can tell you, I know both leadership teams, but sometimes the world just works that way. And, and you, you better have good relations, good friends to help you through it. And a bit of luck on uh, the side, for example, on Zoom. So. Yeah. Well, Jeff, I, I want to thank you personally for writing the book, taking the time to write it. Um, I learned some stuff, even with our little bitty Detroit Economic Club, um, you know, on, on how to run that. So a huge thank you for spending your day uh, yeah. well, with us, uh, spending your morning with us. And folks, once again, you'll see the link in the chat. It is a terrific read. And we left out so many stories from this interview that uh, I wish we had time to tell. So good luck with the book, Great. Jeff. We wish Thanks. you the best. Let us know if we can be helpful. And we want to do this again sometime with you when you're back here in Detroit. Great. Thanks. See you, Steve. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.